Well, good evening, Brent, and welcome along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337-12 Zoom meeting. Uh, I never expected, Brent, that we would have four, uh, but we're now up to 12, uh, and I'm grateful for all our speakers, and in particular, all our guests who come on a weekly basis to join us. Uh, this has been recorded, as usual, and it will be placed on the Lodge Hope of Karachi Facebook pages later on this evening, Brian, and you can access it from there. And please, if there's any debate afterwards and comments and questions, we can carry on within the Facebook pages. As the Grand Lodge of Scotland Digital Guidelines, guidelines remind us, we need to keep our video on. Uh, if there's any questions, can you please put them in the chat at the during the meeting and at the end of the meeting? And at the very end, I will unmute everyone as usual so you can say your goodbyes. Before we, we move on this evening, Brian, uh, I'd just like to take a, a, a minute to, to make mention of the passing this morning uh, of Brother Jack Turpey, uh, past master of the Anchor Lodge of Research through in Renfrewshire West. He, one of our sister research lodges. Uh, I first saw Jack, I, I always called him the stamp man because he, he was a great lover and a great uh, expert on Masonic phil phil and philately, philanthropy. even. Philately. <laughs> uh, I, I'm in ph philanthropy for a business brand, so excuse me getting them mixed up. Uh, but it was very sad to hear this morning that he, he's passed uh, to the Grand Lodge above and the thoughts of Lodge Hope of Karachi are with his mother lodge and the Anchor Lodge of Research. This evening, Brian, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, probably the most well-travelled brother of the Zoom enlightenment because Brother Bob has been all over America and he's regularly promote, uh, presenting in Georgia uh, under the Grand Lodge of Georgia and he presents at least twice a week for I think the last four or five weeks and many of you will have seen his presentations there. But this evening I've asked him to come along to talk to you about uh, one of Scotland's probably one of their most famous brand and he's going to talk to us about him um, not as a poet but as a Freemason. So, Brother Robert Cooper, Curator of the Grand Lodge of Scotland Museum and Library, I hand over to you to enlighten us about Brother Robert Burns. Thanks very much, Gordon. Uh, good evening, brethren, each and every one of you. Thanks very much for, for tuning in. Um, I've always said that uh, um, Lodge Hope of Karachi 337 has uh, led the way um, in, in, during this pandemic by starting uh, Zoom meetings and it's, uh, it's everybody else that's playing catch up with the Lodge. So um, uh, congratulations to, to the Lodge for a really great initiative. Um, I, I too would like to add my uh, condolences uh, on hearing about Jack Turpey. Um, I knew Jack uh, pretty well. Um, I know he hadn't been well for a couple of years at least and he had health issues for some time, um, but <laughs> You're quite right. Um, Jack was a great um, collector of stamps with a Masonic connection. And when he knew I was going away somewhere, um, he would say, well, wherever you go, you know, have a good look around and see what you can find in terms of stamps. And so he had me bringing stamps from various parts of the world that usually depicted a, a Freemason. I think the last ones I got them were um, ones um, that were uh, about John Wayne. Um, you know, the famous, uh, the famous actor. Um, so yeah, it was really sad to hear about Jack. Um, and I never got to connect with him um, in, the, in the last couple of years, which is really quite sad. Anyway, um, it's, uh, it all comes to us one way or the other, sooner or later. Um, so tonight, Robert Burns, uh, 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 another departed brother, although uh, departed a long time ago. Um, I have to say that I mean, I'm I am not a, a Burns expert, um, and neither can I recite uh, long pieces of poetry by him. Um, but he was a, a very, very interesting character, and it's a, a I think it's a, an indication, unfortunately, that as Freemasonry um, is no longer um, as respected as it used to be, um, and certainly in this day and age, as we all know. We have problems uh, 
um, with the media, uh, with, with some politicians and with some religious leaders. And I think for that reason, I mean, that's been going on for quite a long time. And for that reason, um, Robert Burns and his Masonic uh, membership isn't, uh, isn't discussed, even if it is known. Um, but it seems very clear to me um, that uh, the fact that he was a Freemason, and what's more, uh, an ardent uh, Freemason to boot, uh, he simply, people simply don't want to know. And if they do know, they, want, they would prefer to ignore the fact so the more that we can um, promote Robert Burns and his Masonic um, career or his Masonic life, um, in the process of doing that, we're promoting Scottish Freemasonry um, at the same time. So I would make no bones about um, wherever I go, uh, reminding people that Robert Burns was a Freemason. It was one of the, one of the major aspects of his life, uh, his, certainly his adult life. Um, and I'm very disappointed when I go to the Burns Museum very occasionally um, in Ayrshire uh, to discover that Freemasonry is a tiny, a tiny part of the exhibit um, to, to Brother Burns. And uh, the exhibit really only consists of a very small corner and uh, the main, the principal exhibit um, is the mall that he used in Lodge St. Andrew uh, in Dumfries. Um, and it seems to be that this is a political decision to downplay his Masonic membership uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. Perhaps it's a little bit um, like uh, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks with uh, people um, revising history um, in order to make history um, fit their own particular views. Um, if so, that's rather sad because you can't change history. You might dislike it, but you can't change history. The fact that Robert Burns was a Freemason and some people don't like it um, is unfortunate, but you can't change the fact that he was a Freemason. So you shouldn't dislike the man. You can dislike the organization if you wish, but rubbishing the man is not, um, not in my opinion, is basically dishonest um, because you're, you're simply um, telling a lie by omission by not mentioning his Masonic membership. Now don't get me wrong, um, Robert Burns um, and his Masonic life um, is one example amongst many um, that uh, we seem to be undergoing at the moment where um, people will remove the Masonic life of individuals because it doesn't suit their particular agenda. I'll give you an example. Just very recently, I was reading a biography of Thomas Telford, uh, the Scottish um, engineer, who built bridges and canals all over Britain. Um, uh, he was a member of three lodges and I found a member of a Royal Arch chapter. But in his biography, not a mention, not a mention of his Masonic career. And when I wrote to the publisher to point this out, I didn't even get the courtesy of a reply. So that's the problem we have. Now, I have to say, this initiative by this lodge for Zoom meetings, to a large extent, levels the, uh, the playing field for us as Freemasons, because we can discuss Burns's Masonic membership, for example, tonight, um, but it also means that anyone who wants to um, view uh, these lectures will, be, will hopefully become a bit better educated um, on such matters as Freemasonry and Robert Burns. So um, tonight, what I've decided to do, because um, there is a, a rather wonderful painting um, in uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland Museum that people from all over the world come to see, which is something else that very few people um, care to mention uh, in all sorts of different places, but particularly um, the tourist industry, they seem to be happy to ignore the fact that we bring tourists from all over the world because Robert Burns was a Freemason. So we receive visits from uh, mainly English speaking countries to be fair, um, who are coming to Scotland because they are Freemasons and because they know Robert Burns was a Freemason and they're interested um, in seeing uh, his homeland and what Freemasonry is like here. And the painting um, that hangs in the museum uh, in Freemasons Hall on George Street uh, here in Edinburgh um, is probably the best um, visual image that we can use to promote um, Robert Burns and Freemasonry. So we're going to talk about that painting tonight. 
and a little bit about Burns, but as well as that, I want to um, explore um, the characters that are depicted in the painting because it gives us an insight in the, into the type of people um, at that time who were Freemasons. And many of them um, led extremely colorful lives. So I'll, I'll tell you uh, about some of my favorite individuals. I can't tell you about them all. Um, there's simply too many, um, but some of them are extremely interesting indeed. So a little bit about the Lodge. I suppose we all know that Lodge Canongate winning number two um, meets uh, in the Canongate, surprise, surprise, um, in Edinburgh. Um, and it's first mentioned, the Lodge is first mentioned in 1677 when they approached um, Mother Cowinning um, for permission um, to form a lodge in the Canongate. Now, um, uh, Mother Cowinning didn't issue charters as such, but they would, uh, at that time, but they would um, obviously give permission because that's exactly what they record in the minutes that they'd received a request from the Masons of the Canongate um, to form a lodge there. Now, that in itself is a little bit telling because um, uh, at that time, uh, the Cannon Gate, although it's now very much in the centre of Edinburgh, um, the Cannon Gate Borough was actually just outside Edinburgh city walls. And I mean, if you if you go, if you happen to be there uh, in Edinburgh, um, the crossroads um, at the High Street where um, the Royal Mile um, is, is, is broken, if you like, between uh, Edinburgh and Canongate, um, you'll see um, the World's End pub, which is infamous for, for a, another rather gruesome uh, reason. But the World's End pub is so named because that was the gate um, where you left um, the world, um, you left Edinburgh and you, you, you were at the, the World's End and you were going out into the wilderness, so to speak. So perhaps that gives you a little bit of a clue as to why uh, the guys in Canongate didn't ask Lodge, the Lodge of Edinburgh uh, for permission to form a lodge. Um, I suspect they already knew what the answer would be and they weren't going to ask the Lodge of Edinburgh um, for, uh, for their blessing to form a lodge. Um, so they went to Mother Cowinning, um, who probably weren't so aware of the, uh, the local difficulties in Edinburgh, and they gave permission for the lodge to be formed. And that's recorded in Muller Cowinning's minutes, as I say, in the year 1677. The lodge, um, the lodge becomes even more important um, later um, and, and for the, the, well, in the year 1736, um, the, the lodge, well, as you know, the Grand Lodge of Scotland was formed. Um, and one of the prime movers, if not the prime mover, um, was the Lodge of Canongate uh, Kilwinning number two. It was one of the four lodges um, that formed the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Um, and as I say, they were um, very much the dominant, uh, the dominant partner in the four lodges that founded the Grand Lodge of Scotland. The other, the other three, apart from Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, were the Lodge of Edinburgh, Mary's Chapel, Kilwinning Scots Arms, and, and Leith Kilwinning. So, um, and the meetings, all the preparatory meetings, and indeed the inaugural meeting, were all held in Canongate Cowinning's premises in St John Street in Edinburgh. And uh, it's another uh, interesting fact um, that the building um, that the lodge still meets in to this day, um, uh, St John's Chapel uh, in St John Street, is um, the oldest purpose-built lodge in the world. Um, it was built um, in 1735, and it, as I say, it remains the oldest purpose-built lodge room in the world. There are older lodge um, uh, lodges, lodge buildings um, than that. Uh, I know there's a couple uh, in Fife. Um, I, I, forgive me if I can't remember, but I know one um, that meets in a, a very old um, vault um, uh, in Fife. And so there are much, much older buildings, but this was built, purpose built for lodge meetings in 1735. And as I say, it's the oldest purpose built uh, lodge room in the world. So you can begin to see that uh, what's going on in Edinburgh and, and in, Can in the Canongate in particular is one of the things um, that becomes very important um, within our history. And as the uh, 18th century progresses, Lodge Canongate Cowinning uh, number two begins to attract all sorts of very important people, um, lords and, uh, and, and the like, you know, the, 
the, the great and the good, so to speak. And uh, th this becomes one of the centres um, of Freemasonry, this particular lodge. And when Robert Burns came uh, to Scotland, uh, came to Edinburgh um, to uh, oversee the publication of his second edition, uh, the Edinburgh edition, um, when he came, he came here in 1786. Uh, when he came here, he obviously gravitated to um, Lodge Carangate for winning um, because that's where uh, many of his sponsors would be. And like the Kilmarnock edition published in Kilmarnock um, earlier, uh, a large number of the subscribers to the second edition were Freemasons. Um, and so, you know, he, he obviously had contacts in that lodge. And so that's where the painting uh, comes in because, uh, because he was so well known um, and he was an extremely important figure in Scottish society by this time. He became, he was by this time very famous, um, having had his work published and everybody, um, want, you know, there was a lot of fans out there, shall we say. And so he, he was um, made uh, the um, poet laureate um, of uh, Lodge Canongate co winning in 1787. Now, if I can just get this screen sharing thing to work. You should um, be able to, Bob. Good. Um, I, I've, I've tested it a couple of times and I think we're going to get it okay. Um, we just need to. I'm not technically minded, but I, I have been shown um, how to do this. So just bear with me a second. It takes a little while for um, it to load. What I've done, um, for those who are interested in such things, um, I, upload, I now know to upload um, my files um, to, um, to Dropbox. And from there, um, I, can, I can share things uh, much more easily. So uh, we're just, just about there. Bob, when you're looking for that, I'll just inform the Brern from out with the province of Fife and Kinross that the lodge that you're referring to is Elgin and Bruce, and it is the mother lodge of uh, Brother Lord Elgin. And it's uh, called, the buildings are the King's Cellars. And if you go to their website, there's some uh, lovely information about that very ancient building. Good, thanks for that, uh, Gordon. Um, if you can confirm that you can see um, this presentation on your screen. Yes, we're good to go, Bob. Yeah, right, good. Well, that's, I mean, this is, this is not one of these full-blown um, PowerPoint presentations because we're focused very much indeed uh, on this painting. So the, really there is only one slide and forgive me, forgive me for calling them slides. Um, I was brought up in the day of the old analog slide system um, I don't know what you call them slides now, but um, that's what we've got. So, um, so this is the painting um, that we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, as I say, this is the one that hangs in the Grand Lodge um, Museum, and it's very much as you see it now. It does, I have to confess, need a bit of a clean, but I'm hoping that that will be done in the fairly near future. Um, it hasn't been cleaned during my 26 year tenure um, uh, in office, but uh, hopefully we'll get some cash to, to give it some good deep cleaning um, because it is a bit dull in comparison to the original. So we can see um, that this is a very crowded scene and the lodge room is very much as you see it today. If you go there, um, the, the only major thing that I can see from the painting that's not in the same position as that painting on the far wall right hand side, which is of um, uh, William St. Clair of Roslyn, the first Grand Master Mason, who of course was a member of that lodge. Um, and his, his uh, initiation into that lodge is a very curious tale indeed. Um, we'll, if we have time, we'll perhaps come back to that very strange uh, arrangement. So as you can see uh, in the painting, um, Robert Burns is the major uh, character in here. He's being own, uh, offered the laurel wreaths um, by the master of the lodge um, in recognition of the fact that he was on that evening on the 1st of March, uh, made the poet laureate of that particular lodge. Um, 
So, you know, the first of March, I mean, it's a long time ago now, I know, but uh, as I say, the characters um, were extremely interesting. Now, um, the date, what was happening on that, on and about that date? Well, the Seven, Year, the seven Years' War in Europe and particularly in America, where it was called the French-Indian War, and we're going to talk about a character um, uh, that featured in that um, soon, um, had, had ended in 1767. Um, uh, so, yeah, 1767 or thereabouts, um, and so you know it, it was a turbulent time. And as you can see, there's a, a military man in front and centre as well, um, who uh, you know is representative of the military um, uh, personnel that were around at the time. Uh, most a lot of the officers garrisoned in Edinburgh Castle. So let's talk about one or two of the individuals to give you a bit of a flavour um, of of the kind of people that were around and about at the time. And let's start with um, the rather um, rather rotund chap sitting in the bottom uh, right-hand corner um, who is looking at the soldier uh, next to him. Um, this is Francis Gross. And uh, there's always a connection, uh, even no matter how, how distantly, um, with Robert Burns. This guy has got a much more intimate relationship with Robert Burns. His name is Francis Gross. Um, he is, in fact, uh, a father of a Swiss um, a watchmaker who practiced his trade in, in London. Um, hence the name. The name is, is clearly not Scottish. But Francis Gross, as you can see, didn't really have to work terribly hard, um, certainly not manually, um, for his living. Um, he, in, he inherited his father's um, considerable fortune um, from making watches uh, for the aristocracy. And um, uh, gross watches are still sought after today, um, not only because of their age, but, but because of their um, very precise uh, and expert um, manufacture. So Francis, um, Francis, brother Francis, um, decided that because he didn't really have to work all that hard, he'd already got lots of money, um, he was a man of leisure, he decided um, he was going to just have a look around um, England and uh, just just basically um, roll around as a man of leisure. And what he decided to do, um, wherever he stayed in taverns in England, he would usually get into conversations with the locals and he got some wonderful local stories. And um, what he did was he published these in the form of a book called The Antiquities of England. Uh, antiqui antiquities of England and Wales. And of course, he thought, well, this is wonderful. I'm actually getting paid for wandering around the country. And then he said, well, I, I hear there's lots of pubs in Scotland. I'll go there. And uh, that's exactly what he did. He came to Scotland and he would uh, visit the local taverns and inns and pubs. And he'd get uh, involved with the locals and uh, record um, their local uh, tales. And so, um, in some ways, he does a lot like uh, a lot of what Robert Burns did, uh, although Burns was more interested in the poetry and the song. Um, uh, Francis Gross was interested in the, in the actual stories, but they had a so they had a common interest. When Francis um, reached um, Ayrshire, he met Robert Burns, and uh, uh, he said to Burns, um, "Go and tell me uh, a really good story so I can put it in my next book." Um, and Robert Burns said to him, well, okay, if I give you um, a, a piece of poetry for your book, um, I want, um, in return, I want you to draw me um, a picture of Alloway Kirk for a very particular uh, reason. Um, and so they came to that agreement, and what Robert Burns then did was sat down and wrote Tam O'Shanter. And, of course, he wanted an illustration of Alloway Kirk to give him something to look at um, in respect of his po poem, uh, Tam O'Shanter. So Francis um, drew um, Alloway Kirk and did it quite elegantly, um, and it was one of Burns's um, treasured possessions. Fortunately, I don't know where it is now, but um, I can tell you that, we, uh, well, well, before we explain that bit, um, what happened was that because Francis was under no financial pressure whatsoever, he just took his time with these things. Now, the agreement was with Burns that Tam O'Shanter uh, would be published first 
in Francis's book, but Burns got fed up um, waiting, basically, because, um, as I say, Francis was in no particular hurry. So Tam O'Shanter was first published um, in, the, in, in Burns's own works, but Francis did eventually get round to publishing his own book called Surprise, Surprise, The Antiquities um, of Scotland. And, and in that book, there is uh, Tam O'Shanter, and on the next, uh, the opposite page, is his drawing, the drawing he gave um, to Burns of Alloway Kirk. So a very nice story. So we know that they were both Freemasons before Burns came to Edinburgh. And so he, when he gets to Edinburgh, lo and behold, here's Francis Gross, um, ensconced in Lodge Canningate Colonial Number no. 2. And um, no doubt they got together and shared a couple of beers or whatever um, and renewed their acquaintance. So a very nice little story about how two Freemasons give rise to one of Scotland's uh, most famous um, uh, narrative poems by Burns Tam O'Shanter. And for those of you who um, really look at uh, the work of Burns, um, you will see that there are um, uh, quite a lot of Masonic references in the work of Burns that are unknown um, to so-called uh, uh, Burns scholars because they're not Freemasons. And Tam O'Shanter is one of them. Um, uh, I'll not give the game away at this stage, but um, it, it certainly has got Masonic elements in it. So that's, uh, that's our, our, our brother Francis. The next guy I want to talk about is on your bottom left-hand corner, um, wearing a powdered wig. This is um, a chap called James Burnett, Lord Mondobo. Um, or is it Lord Monbodo? I never can quite remember. Um, he was a senior lawyer. He gets his title because of, he was a law lord. Um, and he's very famous, certainly in, in, in Edinburgh at the time, he was very famous, um, as well as being um, a, a superb legal mind. And occasionally, to, even today, some of his um, judgments, his court judgments, um, are used in Scottish courts today because he was a, he was a groundbreaker in many ways uh, in the Scottish legal system. But nobody really remembers him for that reason. They all remember him, those that do, um, remember him because he was a very eccentric uh, gentleman. Um, he had some very strange ideas. Um, the most famous one, uh, which I'll tell you about, is that uh, he believed that all male children were born with a monkey's tail. Um, what's more, he believed that there was a big female conspiracy um, in, in, in the School of Midwifery, which was based here um, at Edinburgh Medical School at the University. He believed that the midwives um, were all part of some kind of secret organization. Um, you, can see, you can see where he's getting these ideas from, in, in, the, in part anyway. And he believed that what, was, what actually happened was um, that when the child was born, the male child was born, the midwives um, cut off um, this monkey's tail or monkey type tail um, from the male children in order to keep secret the fact that us men all originally had a monkey's tail at birth. Um, and what's more, I mean, we, we have contemporary reports about his campaigns because he really did believe this was a, a female conspiracy. He campaigned to have the school of midwifery abolished. And when there was no midwives around, um, we would all, um, we would all realize that we did have a monkey's tail and then we could decide whether we wanted to keep it or not. Um, and so he campaigned to try and um, have, have this, this uh, very recent profession suppressed because he thought there was something very, very dodgy going on. Now, um, I, we all know, of course, that this is obviously um, pretty much nonsense. But what I can tell you is that at the time um, that he's raving on and on and on um, about this, um, at the same time, there is a gentleman um, who's a member of Lodge St. David number 36, which was another uh, very important lodge in Edinburgh, um, and it tended to attract um, uh, ministers of religion and uh, students of physic, as it was called, uh, st medical students from the university. 
And one of those medical students was um, by the name of Erasmus Darwin. Now, Erasmus Darwin was the grandfather of Charles Darwin, who wrote The Origin of the Species, basically claiming that we are all descended from apes. Now, um, I can just imagine, now, we're now moving from known fact to speculation, but it's a little bit of fun. Um, I can just imagine Erasmus Darwin telling his grandson Charles, you know, when I was at university in Edinburgh, there was this crazy old man running around claiming that we were all descended from monkeys. And whether or not Charles uh, ever got that tale, and whether or not he ever set out to prove or disprove it, we're never going to know for sure. But it's a wonderful story um, that circulated, certainly at that time. Um, and certainly uh, our, our friend James Burnett is, is on record um, as, as trying to um, do away with the profession of midwifery for that reason. So again, another little story. So these are a couple of the characters that are surrounded uh, or surrounding Robert Burns during his time in Edinburgh, certainly. The next person, and, and probably the last one um, to tell you about, is an individual who's almost dead center of the screen. And he's the middle one of a group of three. Um, I don't know if you can, you can see him, he's wearing a wig. Um, the guy on his left is in brown, the guy on his right is in blue and you can really only see his head and shoulders. Um, this, is a, this is a very interesting chap by the name of uh, John Williamson. And his story um, is probably the most exotic um, of them all. And again, we know a lot about him. Uh, he was from Aberdeen. He was a young boy uh, in Aberdeen. And at a young age, can't be certain of his age because of um, the records of the time, but um, he was certainly a young teenager, and he was kidnapped um, from Aberdeen Beach, uh, just outside the harbour. He was kidnapped and, and put aboard um, a ship um, in, in, at anchor in the harbour. Um, and he was uh, kidnapped along with um, dozens of other children um, of a variety of ages, both male and female. And he, say, he was um, uh, shipped across the Atlantic, um, to the colonies. And this is, again, it's a, a, a well-documented uh, story, but basically um, he was, of all the children, um, he was probably one of the luckiest ones because when he uh, arrived, they were all sold into um, penal servitude, essentially legal, legalized slavery. So although we are very conscious of slavery uh, to this day, you have to also remember that um, a lot of European type people were also slaves um, and that he is one of these uh, examples. So Williamson, I think his name was Thomas, now that I remember it, uh, we'll find out. But anyway, Williamson, um, regardless of his Christian name, um, Williamson um, was fortunate. Uh, he was sold to a, another Scot. Um, who came to consider him to be more of a son rather than a slave. Um, most of the children um, had a really um, rough time. Uh, they were typically sent to frontier um, frontiersmen um, who were trying to hack a living out of the wilderness. Um, many of them simply perished. Uh, they were not paid, of course, because of um, the, the terms of their indentiture. Um, but they were fed and clothed probably not terribly well. Um, and Williamson, as I say, was lucky enough to be sold to a Scot who was more sympathetic to his plight than most. And um, on, um, on his death, his master um, uh, released him from, uh, from servitude. So he was a, was a free man. Now this was in the uh, early, parts of, uh, early part of the 1750s and Peter Williamson, Peter Williamson, his name came back to me there, definitely Peter, Peter Williamson, or Indian Pete, as he became known. Um, Peter uh, went off to fight the Indians. He joined the, the, the army, the militia, anyway, guarding the frontier. And when the uh, Seven Years' War, or the French-Indian War, as it was called, broke out in North America, 
he was um, he was fighting alongside um, uh, British colonialists against the French and Indians. And we know a lot about this because he later, he survived, he later published a book uh, called French Indian uh, Cruelty, um, which was a, a huge seller in its day. Anyway, Peter, Peter was fighting um, alongside other um, British people when this, throughout this war. He was unlucky, he was captured. He was not captured by French people, he was captured by um, Indians. Um, who were allied with the French, and he 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 suffered quite gravely because, having been captured, he was treated very much as a a beast of burden. Um, he just had to carry and fetch things. He was constantly tied up, and he was hobbled, uh, so he he couldn't run away. He was uh, at night. He was uh, tied up and thrown on the ground, basically. And I, he suffered incredibly badly during one particular winter. And so he decided that um, even if he ran away and was killed um, for, for doing that, it was far better than um, his situation at the time. Anyway, he did run away and he managed, managed just, according to his own account, uh, he just managed to escape. He made his way back um, to the, uh, the colonies where he... Um, uh, he was released. Uh, I think he was actually, when I think about it, he was actually put aboard, uh, you know, he escaped and was then captured by the, uh, by the French who put him aboard a ship back to Britain, um, uh, repatriating. It was a prisoner of exchange. And in, in, as a result of that exchange, he ended up back here um, in Britain. And he, uh, he landed in London, but made his way to York, where seemingly he tried to get money to get back to Scotland from the local Freemasons. Now, whether or not um, he'd been made a Freemason um, in the colonies um, before he uh, left for Britain, we'll probably never, never know. But certainly um, he, he, um, he did try and get money from, from people in York. He did get money and he went back to Aberdeen, his hometown. Now, this is a matter of court record. When he was in Aberdeen, he sued the Aberdeen City Council of the time um, for allowing the children to be kidnapped. There was um, grave suspicion that the uh, officials, the, the council officials, um, were taking bribes from these slavers to allow their children to be shipped um, to America to the American colonies, um, and you know he sued them for this gross de dereliction of duty, um, and uh, needless to say, of course, the very people that were listening to the to the case in court were all Aberdeen people, and so needless to say, he didn't succeed um, in uh, suing the council in Aberdeen, and that's how he comes, uh, how he ends up in Edinburgh because he took his case to the High Court. And I suspect, but I don't know about this for sure, but I suspect our James Burnett character may have been his legal advisor. Anyway, again, as a matter of court record, um, Peter Williamson then sues Aberdeen City Council um, for damages um, in Edinburgh, and his case is successful. He wins his case, and. Uh, Aberdeen City Council have to settle with him. They have to uh, pay a substantial um, amount of money in terms of damages, and that set him up for life. He was able to buy uh, a pub in Edinburgh. And he's very celebrated, uh, or celebrated at the time, because every now and again, probably when he'd had a few of his own drinks, um, he would dress up as an Indian um, and, and dance around the streets to entertain the locals complete with a, a tobacco pipe and a tomahawk and headdress and all the rest of it. Um, so he's famous for that. And his book um, was a, a bestseller, as I say. And very interestingly, the frontispiece, which is a, a woodcut of himself uh, dressed up as an Indian, immediately above um, the woodcut are um, Masonic symbols. 
a square, compasses, a plum rule, and a level, although not in our, not in our normal um, uh, configuration, but certainly in the way that they were, they were shown, commonly shown at that time. So in that sense, um, this idea that he was a Freemason in America and went, uh, tried to get money from the Freemasons of York may well have been true. Um, certainly he was a member of Lodge Canongate for winning uh, number two, and he is known to have supplied the booze for the harmonies um, because he was obviously an innkeeper or tavern keeper and he had access to that kind of thing. So these are the kind of characters that we have surrounding um, Robert Burns. Now, just before um, I conclude, because uh, I think I've probably bored you long enough, um, it's a very interesting thing has uh, just uh, appeared, if you like. I've been asked to make a, a small contribution to a book which mentions Burns. And during that, uh, during that little bit of research, um, I came across a very interesting fact. When Burns um, uh, passed away um, in Dumfries, uh, he, he apparently had asked that he bury, be buried in uh, St. Cuthbert's graveyard in a particular place, and that was the northeast corner. And he was ultimately buried in the northeast corner, but um, his, his grave was only marked by a very modest slab paid for by his wife, Jean Armour. And later, a lot of people decided this really wasn't good enough for Scotland's National Bard. And so they decided they were going to fundraise and build what is now uh, the, the Burns Mausoleum. So the poor guy was dug up by um, non-Masons because they didn't, or they weren't interested, way back to the beginning of my story, they weren't interested at all about uh, the fact that Burns was a Freemason, and therefore they saw no relevance um, to the place that he was interred uh, initially. By a happy coincidence, however, they chose somewhere else that was almost as equally significant, and that was the southeast corner. So he's now buried um, in the southeast corner of St. Uh, uh, Cuthbert's graveyard. So just a, a few facts about the characters around at the time of Burns' uh, uh, period in Edinburgh. The fact that he remained a committed Freemason all of his life. He died um, a senior warden of Lodge St. Andrew um, uh, in Dumfries. Um, and as I say, he, he died, of course, he died in, in the July. Um, so uh, the, the Lodge wasn't meeting. So he died in active office as a Freemason. Again, unfortunately, these little things are simply never mentioned, and I don't know about you, but they do tend to annoy the hell out of me by the sheer omission of them. Hopefully you found that to be of some interest, and um, by all means, please ask some questions. I'm not promising you'll get an answer, but I will do my best. Bob, as usual, on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors this evening, can I thank you for once again giving us a very entertaining and informative presentation this evening. And knowing the brand that we have got with us this evening, I'm sure you're going to have quite a few questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to try and uh, scroll down and see if there's any watch. There is a, a, a very nice comment, Bob, here uh, that I'll read out first of all. Uh, hashtag, this is one of the best presentations I have ever listened to since I joined Freemasonry. I've looked at this very painting many, many times, but never knew of these people or these stories. Thank you, Bob. Good, my pleasure. So from Ken Wallace, Bob, the brother in the southeast wearing the green grey jacket appears to be holding something resembling a camera in his outstretched right arm. Any thoughts on this? Um, right, let me just call up the picture. Of course, I did close it down. Um, is that in the kind of organ loft area? I'm just trying to... Let me just... In the southeast, he's saying... So that's, 
that's what left hand side bottom right. left I'm comp I'm bottom left. He's holding a camera. No, it'll be no it'll be well it'll be about the middle on the left, I would think, Bob, just in front of the dais. Yeah, so he's stuck. Oh, if you look at the top left hand corner, you see it. Oh, Ken's there, so what left? Top what left, left hand corner. Oh, is oh you know, is this the figure you can just see his head, shoulders, and arm? Yeah, and his arms outstretched. And yeah. It looks like a, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I mean, this is this is what we used to do at school. They're passing notes to each other, um, because they don't want to interrupt the ceremony, unlike today when some people are happy to talk. Um, no, they he's they're, they're notes. Um, in the original, you can see it, it's a it's a little piece of paper. With some scribbling on it, so that's that's what they're doing. They're passing notes together because he's passing it to someone in the in in the organ loft. Um, I suspect it's some kind of request for music once the wee ceremony is over. Yeah. We've got it's a, more sweetie. Well, or, well, it might be. It might say tunnocks on the wrapper. That could be what the writing is. <laughs> Well, Sir, Sir Boyd is a good Freemason as well as we know, brother Bob. Uh, Ian Kennedy makes a comment. Uh, his good lady researched Peter Williamson doing a family history. And it is believed that he was inspiration for a man called Horse. It's not impossible, actually. It's not impossible because when the, um, uh, Peter's book, French and Indian Cruelty in the Colonies, I can't remember the full title, um, I mean, I have had thoughts about reprinting it, um, but it's actually very gruesome. He describes in enormous detail um, exactly what happened to certain individuals, men, women, and children. Um, and I think probably it's, it would not be appropriate um, in this day and age because the people who were committing the torture were Indians, so probably not politically acceptable anymore. But um, remembering what uh, Richard Harris goes through in terms of his initiation into the Indian tribe would not, I, would not surprise me at all that that's where that inspiration came from. Um, I would need to, I would need to reread the book, to be honest, in order to be able to, to sort of say more firmly than that. Ian Glennie, you've got a question if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Bob, thanks for the presentation. Um, a couple of observations. First of all, it was St Michael's Kirkyard and no St Cuthbert's. All right, uh, okay. And, and in terms of the Masonic connection, um, 200 years after the mausoleum was commissioned, the, um, the Brethren of Dumfries held a rededication ceremony for the mausoleum. And they actually checked that the mausoleum was both level, plumb and square using the tools from the Operative Lodge of Dumfries 140. And these were indeed the very tools that were used at the original commissioning of that mausoleum. And as a result, the Masonic connection of Burns could never have been more public at that time. Um, it was sad that, few, that no more Freemasons were there. There were less than 150 of us there. My question is this, in terms of Captain Francis Gross, as many people in their immortal memory say, gross by name and gross by nature, <laughs> um, because of his corpulent frame. Um, he did two drawings of the old Kirk at Alloway, one of which appeared in the Antiquities of Scotland. But there was another one that was given to Burns himself, and it was chosen because it was taken from a view that showed Burns's mother and father's grave. And no one can find that picture these days. Any views on that, Bob? Do you know if it still exists within the, the museum in Edinburgh? Not, not the Masonic one, but the National Museum. Or is it lost forever? Yeah, I, I, don't, know, I don't know where it is. Um, unfortunately, uh, on Burns' death, lots of things that he owned seem to have been cast to the four winds. Um, I know that he did have 
that uh, Francis's uh, picture um, on the wall, uh, his, his wall. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he had it transferred to his bedroom and uh, it was in his bedroom when he died. Um, and so, who knows, souvenir hunters and all the rest of it, you know. Um, but I, I don't know of its uh, whereabouts now, um, sadly. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ian. Bob, a question from Bob Potter. Uh, how many brethren in the painting have you identified? Secondly, they seem to be wearing English style aprons. Is that correct? Yes. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, of the, in the painting, there's only one individual that we haven't identified, and that's the guy who's seated um, on the right hand side, just inside the entryway where you can see two characters coming through. The guy to their left, we don't know who he is, but everyone else has, is named. Um, the artist, um, William Stuart Watson, I'm sure it is, um, he, he, he named everyone who was in the painting. So we, knew, we know who they all are. Um, some of them we know a lot about because we've got their name, and some of them are um, simply not not important enough, is that, that, that's the right word, not prominent enough um, uh, to be able to go into great detail of, as to their lives. But yeah, we know them all except that one individual, he's labelled as a visitor. Um, as, as to the aprons, um, this, this goes back to the formation um, of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And what happened was, um, because uh, the Grand Lodge of England had been founded some years earlier, the people in Edinburgh who were responsible for um, sort of trying to organise a new, a new body called a Grand Lodge, they went to, uh, or they modelled everything on what, was, what had happened in London, right down to the necessity of having four lodges as founding lodges of the Grand Lodge of, of Scotland. Of course, a lot more eventually um, were, were involved, but the four lodges that I, I, I mentioned earlier were identical to the four lodges that founded the Grand Lodge um, of England. Now, we happen to know quite a lot about um, the formation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, and the people involved, and we know that there was one member of Canongate Co winning um, in particular, uh, a namesake, uh, Richard Cooper um, from London, who had come to Edinburgh um, to set up an engraving business here, uh, which, which he ended up being extremely successful in. Um, but he had strong ties with the new Grand Lodge in London. And um, it seems very clear that the exact details of how to form this newfangled body called the Grand Lodge, the instructions came for information came from London to the members of Canongate Co winning via Richard Cooper, who also had a house in St. John Street, um, where the lodge building was and is. And so they decided to, you know, they didn't need to re reinvent the wheel. They simply copied what they were doing in London, right down to the shape of the aprons that they were using in England. And that's how they end up in the painting. Having said that, there's one small, um, a caveat to all that, that although the, although the Grand Lodge was founded in 1736, this painting has not, uh, was not painted until 100 or so years um, after the founding of Grand Lodge. So we can't be sure that the aprons in the painting were identical to what they were using in 1736, but um, it seems clear that they retained the English influence um, and Today, their aprons are very similar to that in the painting. And indeed, um, unlike most of Scottish, Scottish lodges, um, they also celebrate St. John the Baptist's Day, which is very uncommon uh, in Scotland and never featured in Scottish Freemasonry. Um, uh, and if it does, it's probably more by accident than, than design. So yes, sorry for the kind of long-winded answer, but that's, that's what we are pretty sure happened. Thank you, Bob. Hopefully that answers your question, Bob Potter. Uh, there's a, a comment from uh, Doug, 
Dr. Douglas Nicholl, uh, asking me to tell the Bern here this evening about the connections of the Burns family with the Lodge Hope of Karachi. Uh, but for the sake of time, Brian, I will put information up on the Facebook pages afterwards. And I think as a lodge, we are very uh, proud to have that connection as well. There is also another lodge in Fife that has got a connection to uh, Burns family, and that's Lodge St. Cerf. Uh, some would argue that's the dual in the province. Some would say that it's not, uh, but that's a debate locally. Uh, but I think what that comes back to, Brother Bob Cooper, is that, again, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Fife and Kinross in our, our province here can claim great antiquity to all these famous Freemasons. Uh, and I will keep on fighting that good fight. Uh, Finlay Ross uh, has a, a comment. First time I've noticed the organ in the photo. That is, I believe, the original organ. And I was surprised to see when I visited that it's still being a hand bellow style. Can Bob confirm if it is in fact the case? Well, Finlay, I can confirm it's still a hand bellow uh, because six months ago I had to sit next to the organist and I had to pump that organ up and down. Uh, and uh, it does take a little bit of uh, complexity. Uh, Bob, any further comment on the history of the organ? Yes, the, the organ is, is, is quite famous. It was made by um, John Schnitzler, um, a German organ, organ maker um, who uh, had an organ making factory um, in London. And, and so it's a very famous um, organ um, because not many of them made it uh, this far north. Um, the story goes, uh, I don't think this is any, um, any way recent, but certainly maybe 50 uh, more years ago, um, the, the lodge decided that um, uh, as, a, as a lodge rule, that anyone who was last in the lodge before the tile, um, that, that last person was the official organ bellows pumper. And um, what happened was, of course, nobody wanted to be the organ bellows pumper. And so people started arriving earlier and earlier for the lodge meeting and typically the meeting uh, was fully uh, fully packed by uh, an hour before and they were all waiting praying that somebody would be the last guy in so that the last one of them didn't have to actually pump the organ um, and needless to say that rule didn't last terribly long because it threw the timetable completely to uh, out of the window so but that was one of the stories that an old past master told me some from years ago, so I don't know if it's true, but it's a, wonder, a wonderful story nonetheless. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Callum says he's a way to get his copy of Tamashanter out and reread it to find out, see if he can spot the Masonic clues, and I'm sure there'll be other Bern doing that this evening. Craig Allison's got a question for you. Do you think it bothered Burns that he ever became, he didn't become master of the lodge? Well, a little bit of confusion here. In those days, um, the master of the lodge um, was essentially, the usually, um, certainly in the rural areas where, where Burns lived, for example, um, was a, a, a locally prominent individual. Um, and another good example, just to, to make that point, um, the lodge of Kirkintillock, um, I'm sure it's Kirkintillock, the local laird was the Earl of Kilmarnock and they wanted him as the master of their lodge, regardless of the fact that he wasn't even a Freemason. So they, keep, they kept writing to him to become a master of lodge. And this was very important in those days to have a locally powerful uh, person who was going to sort of protect you, if you like, from, um, from ne'er-do-wells. Um, and so Kilmarnock actually became master of the lodge before he was initiated. Now, same thing happened in rural Ayrshire, where the local laird um, became the master of the lodge, and he was typically asked to make some kind of financial contribution for the honour, but they very, very rarely attended the lodge. So what actually happened was, although the local laird would be the master, the deputy master, in Burns's case, the deputy master performed all the functions of the master of the lodge because the master never turned up. So when Burns was the uh, deputy master um, of his lodge, he performed all the functions that we would perform today as a master. 
and and, and, and he did so uh, for quite a long time, for a period of two or three years. And he was, in fact, deputy master, or in effect, master of the lodge when his brother Gilbert was initiated, for example. So no, I don't think he had any regrets because he was doing exactly what the master would do anyway. We've got lots of other comments in the chat. Uh, congratulations to you, Bob. There's a couple of references to where you can pick up a, a book, a Grand Lodge of Scotland book, that talks more about the painting as well. Uh, there, there's a, a comment, and I'm sure this is uh, rather uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, from one of the Brown from Lodge number two, saying that he's never heard about that organ in 40 years. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that's just Charles and his little joke. Uh, so. As, as far as I can see, Brian, I think we've uh, covered out all the, the questions that are in the chat. Uh, let me just have a quick double check. There is one question, Bob, uh, and I, I don't think it's one that you're able to, to answer uh, currently in, in the current situation, so uh, I'll, I'll probably help you out on this one. And the question is, would you be prepared to do this uh, as an open presentation within the Freemasons Hall and Grand Lodge to the public? Uh, but I think that's something that we would need to be talked about uh, in the future. Yeah, well, when we, when we know, I can, we can say, Gordon, that when we know members of the public are there, and we're talking about um, the painting, and we do get lots of members of the public. Um, we get lots of non-Masons, typically um, a Mason uh, from America will turn up with his wife, uh, they will turn up as a group, um, and so we give a lecture on the painting, but of course we don't, uh, we don't go in depth into the Masonic side of things. So the story about, um, the story about uh, Peter Williamson and uh, his connection with North America uh, goes down very well. So we just simply modify the lecture a bit uh, to, su to suit the audience, basically. We, we have another question for you, Bob, and uh, I'm not surprised that this comes from a, a provincial Grand Master, uh, as one of his duties is to check annually on the lodges and how good the ritual work is. So Doogie Filan's question to you, is there any report on how good Burns was as a master and at his ritual? No, as simple as that, there isn't. But um, lots of reports um, of, of his eloquence um, when meeting um, other people is, is on record. Uh, that's why he was uh, in many ways so successful in Edinburgh. If he was a, a real uh, ruffian or a roughneck, uh, redneck, call him what you will, he simply wouldn't have been invited to um, polite society um, for conversations over a cup of tea. Um, and of course, you may, may know of the famous uh, painting, the, the one and only time that he met Sir Walter Scott, when Sir Walter Scott was a, was a young, uh, I think he was a teenager. Um, and Scott, I think, uh, remarks on the fact that this man was extremely well spoken and obviously very intelligent. So there's many accounts of, as to his ability, as well as that, apparently, and I, I can't remember where the source of this is, but apparently he was a, a very good singer as well. So all that sort of suggests to me that um, he, he would be very good um, at his ritual um, because he was able to, obviously, to recite his own poetry and he even uh, sing uh, and hold conversations with the intelligentsia of Edinburgh. So I've got no doubt that he was exceptionally good at his ritual. Bob, on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope Karachi and all our visitors, can I once again thank you so much for coming along this evening and giving us the benefits of your knowledge. Brian, next week uh, I will be looking forward to introducing to you, brother, Mike Hearn, who is a past master of Lodge Felix, one of our sister research and lecture lodges uh, up in Aberdeenshire. And he's going to talk to us about Freemasonry in the Middle East. Uh, those of you who may be up on things uh, about the Middle East will appreciate that Lodge Felix was originally one of the Scottish lodges 
over there. And I think that's what has uh, inspired Mike to, to research lodges in the Middle East. This coming Thursday, Brian, uh, it's a very special day for, for my dad. Uh, he's had me for 50 years and I look forward to uh, him bestowing me with presents. And uh, I'm only saying that to you, Brian, because he's on the meeting this evening. Uh, but it's also uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland have decided to give me a, a very special birthday present. And the Heritage and History Group will be launching their first lecture. It will be at seven o'clock. It's been advertised on Scottish Craft Freemasonry pages, and it will be a, a presentation by the Provincial Grand Master of uh, Kilwinning, Brother Tom Wood, and he will be talking and discussing the Mother Lodge, uh, Lodge uh, Mother Kilwinning number nothing. Uh, as I intimated at the beginning, Brian, for those of you who want to join that, you need to change your name uh, to Gordon Mickey and your lodge number. That is one of the, the small rules that the, the chaps from the Her History and Heritage Group have implemented. So I look forward to seeing many of you at that on Thursday evening. Brian, as usual, I'm going to try and unmute you all. If I use the, the mouse for the right computer, the challenges of having two computers next to you, Brian, and allow you to say your own thank yous and good evenings to Brother Bob Cooper. Bob, once again, thank you, sir. You're unmuted. Thank you, brother. Much. Thank you, Bob. Very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Cheers, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, very much. Thanks, Bob. That was excellent. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Well done, Bob. Take care. See you soon. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob, for entertaining us again. Take care. Bye. That was Thanks, absolutely Kim. brilliant. Well, Cheers, well, thanks. well done, Bob. I like, I like the presentation for the, the new that. beard. <laughs> yeah, at least he'll get me every place, Ronnie. Fools and horses, <laughs> come to mind. Fools and horses. <laughs> there's, no bar, there's no barbers open in Edinburgh. Ah, uh, well, in the war. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Excellent lecture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Bob, thank you very much indeed for an excellent presentation. That was lovely. And also, thank you to Nobby and Gordon for inviting me. Thank you. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, brother, Bob, you. brother Bob, thanks very much. Great lecture. One of your better ones. When are we going to hear about the other characters in the painting? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we could do, we could easily do that again. Um, there's a lot of them there. I think there's over 80, um, although some, as I say, some of them aren't terribly well known. But uh, yeah, they, they were just my personal favourites. But there's lots of others worth talking about. I look forward to that one, Bob. Thank you, Bob, very much for your very informative, excellent lecture as usual. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. Good. Thanks very much, Tony. Thank you, Bob. All right. Ah, John. Yeah, nice to see you. Right, brother. I'm going to give us our normal final countdown, but I just did see one brother there uh, that I would just like to give a, a little mention to, uh, brother Alistair Slider Marshall. I. This is your penultimate day as the Provincial Grand Master of Stirlingshire. And I would just like to thank you, sir, for the support that you've given to Lodge Hope of Karachi during your term as Provincial Grand Master. And sir, I hope you enjoy your retirement and that you keep on coming around the lodge. Bern, I'm going to give you five, four. Thank you, Bob. Three. Thanks very much, Bob. Two. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. One. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, Brian. Thank you. Hey, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.